last week we uh, did PLL, right? And uh, so we are going to change. The, we we studied VCOs, then we studied PLL, and we looked at the uh, different architectures. And um, if you remember, a while ago we did receiver architectures. So now I would like to move into transmitter aspect of the uh, of course, basically. So today we will do transmitter architectures, and then uh, from that we will work on PAs, you know, power amplifiers. And so that way you have been exposed to almost, I mean, you have been exposed to every component in a typical uh, transceiver uh, that you would, if you if you end up working on an RF uh, systems company, you you will be, uh, you know, uh, working, you, you've been exposed to all these different uh, fundamentals and, uh, you know, maybe 2.0 type of concepts. Uh, and then from there you can definitely uh, dive further, read more literature and things like that. So today we are going to talk about transmit architecture. Okay, so simplest example of a transmitter, if you have a VCO and if you remember the V-tune voltage, right? And let's say if you, if you put in a voltage, uh, whatever data, uh, let's call the data, uh, generally data is represented as BB, BB is for baseband, okay, uh, X of T and then that goes out and what will happen here, you will see really high frequency and then you will see low frequency and again high frequency, okay, if it is, uh, however, there is an issue with um, sudden uh, change in frequency, right? Whenever you have anything that's happening sudden, you you typically have used a lot of uh, um, spectrum, okay? So this uses broad spectrum. So what you, of course, if you use broad spectrum, then what do you do? You take this uh, data of yours and then you feed it through a Gaussian filter, okay? Filter. Okay, and then uh, and this is all from your communication concepts that you guys have learned in different classes, right? And then you feed it to the VCO. So Gaussian filter, what it will do is it will smooth the edges um, and things like that, right? And then once you do that, then you get really spectrally efficient um, uh, modulation scheme. And uh, basically you will have and then it will slowly change to and then again it will increase something like that. And this is your X G M S K, okay, time domain. Okay, and this is what is used in your GSM, uh, you know, cell phones basically. Okay, so let's draw, write the equation for uh, GMSK, X GMSK T is equal to AC, that's your amplitude and cos of omega C T, okay, that's your uh, carrier frequency and then plus M and integral of X B B uh, T, okay, that's your data coming in. And then you have, uh, you multiply that with or you convolve with the transfer function, okay. That's your d tau and, um, and that's it. So this part m is the modulation index, right. Okay. So you are all familiar with it, right. And then this is uh, h, of, h of t is your uh, impulse response. And um, we can rewrite this as uh, again, you know, your AC cos omega C T plus 5, okay. And then this looks like AC, I am just substituting this for the phase, this part here, okay. So this will be AC cos omega C T uh, cos of 5 minus AC sin omega C T sin of 5. Okay, and this 5 is our uh, m integral um, uh, x b b uh, h of uh, tau d tau etc. Okay, now if you had to implement this in analog, right, what would you do? So you would take your um, um, x b b, okay, t and then you would put it through a Gaussian filter, Gaussian filter and then you would integrate it, whatever the transfer function is, okay, 
uh, whatever you are getting in and then one side you will put it through cos and other side you will put it through sin. All right, and then you will multiply and then you will multiply here, uh, here by cos omega ct and here it is by sin omega ct, okay. And then you would, on one side you would add, on other side you would subtract. And uh, this is our uh, final transmitted signal, x gmsk, all right. So basically, we are taking the digital signal and we are doing pulse shaping, and then um, then we are transmitting, right? So this is happening in um, in analog domain. All this stuff. Uh, however, um, uh, you know, all this stuff is happening at low frequency. So low frequency filter. What's the issue with low frequency filters? If you really want to do low, I mean, this is you know compared to the transmitter frequency this is happening at very low frequency right so then uh, if you have a low frequency means your time constant is high or low hmm? high so rc product is high or low high which means r and c values are high or low high so then integration becomes a problem right because then all the component values are large that's kind of the way to look at it so these are bulky bulky filters okay so, not exactly amenable to uh, chip implementation, okay. So, then uh, of course, you know, um, we want to do everything in digital. So, the digital solution is, um, you know, fairly straightforward. So, this is a digital box, okay. So, digital filtering, everything you do in digital domain and this x dB of t is the data that is coming in, okay, from uh, whatever your um, uh, uh, baseband processor uh, or uh, DSP is and then one I side goes to IDAC and Q side goes to QDAC, okay. DAC is a D2A converter, okay. And then we filter it out. Why do we filter this out? Somebody can tell. I mean you, you are doing mixed signal class now, right. So, you should know. Why do we filter out DAC output? Huh? If you look at the DAC output spectrum, what does it look like? If you just look at the DAC output, you will see whole bunch of images, right? And out of which you just want to transmit uh, the low frequency one, right? You don't want to transmit the high frequency one. So, you want to filter that out. And this is kind of anti-aliasing filter. And, and this we again multiply with uh, cos sine, okay? plus minus and then there you go time down okay. So, uh, this is kind of uh, a direct conversion transmitter because we just, we just take a baseband and you transfer it directly to RF uh, frequency just like down conversion you know direct conversion receiver we, we take in the RF signal and we down convert it directly to DC. Here we are going from DC all the way to okay. So, this is direct transmitter okay and x of t is equal to a of t uh, cos of omega c t plus phi t and um, this is your a of t cos omega c t that is a carrier frequency and cos of phi t minus a of t sin omega c t sin of phi t all right. So, we can define now looking at these two, we can define the quadrature signals. Signals okay x b b uh, I t is equal to A of t cos phi t and similarly Q is equal to A of t sin phi t, okay. So, we can definitely generate these signals in digital itself, right and then 
then multiply with cos omega C T and sin omega C T and then transmit. And that is what is being done uh, in the digital domain, ok. So, we get these i and q signals which is x b b i and you get x b b q ok signals these two from digital and then we multiply um, cos omega c t sin omega c t plus plus minus ok. Now that we got this signal though what do we do with it right. This signal is still not uh, you cannot still transmit it because we need to increase the power because when you want to transmit you want to transmit at certain power level so that you can reach certain distance right. So, but before you do that you generally have a PA pre driver. PA is a power amplifier ok. Um, it is called PA pre driver. And then uh, you have the real power amplifier hmm? and then that goes to a matching network ok and then that will go to a diplexer and then it will go into antenna where we are transmitting. The purpose of the diplexer is you can um, you can go uh, it is a one way valve kind of operation. So, the antenna signal when it is coming in from the antenna it will only go to the receive ok and the PA signal when it is coming out it will only go to the antenna that is what the diplexer does ok. All right. So, the re why do we have this uh, PA drive pre driver because the capacitance of this power amplifier can be high ok and you have to drive you, you need lot of drive strength to uh, you know output a large amount of power. So, that is why you need this pre driver generally. So, typically uh, you know up till here is all integrated on chip and if it is a low power application maybe like Bluetooth or things like that then maybe even the power amplifier can be integrated on chip ok. Because this power amplifier if it is transmitting lot of power then um, you know it needs to be very efficient uh, because the power amplifier power budget can be as high as the entire device budget because uh, finally, you need to pump out that much power. So, you can go long distance ok. So, so many times you have this PA outside um, and in a, in a exotic technology uh, for your cell phones for example, right. Uh, the PAs are separate in a separate chip um, because they heat up quite a lot also. So, you do not want to heat up your rest of the chip. Uh, so, the pre driver many times is included on chip. Uh, along with all the like a system on a chip type of implementation um, and uh, so just something to think about ok. Ok. So, now we have these two paths right we have an I path and a Q path these two paths. So, uh, let us uh, let us study the non idealities between them those paths and then um, what does it uh, what does it do to you or what are these non idealities to you. So, um, just like we did in the 0 I f case right you have I Q mismatch. ok. So, you had x of t which is equal to alpha 1 a 1 plus delta a I will explain what these are and then cos of omega c t uh, plus delta theta ok plus alpha 2 a sin of omega c t ok. So, what is going on this is my i, I term and this is my q term. In the i term I have modified my amplitude by 1 plus delta a ok. So, there is a mismatch between the i side amplitude and q side amplitude and also there is a phase error in the i side versus q side. So, just an example of showing you uh, how this works and then uh, your data bits are alpha 1 and alpha 2 right. So, they will be going um, you know alpha 1 and alpha 2 they will be going plus minus 1 they will be having data bits plus minus 1 value and that is what we will be transmitting. So, uh, if you if you remember we did this constellation diagram right. So, if you had a QPSK then the constellation looks like this right you have 4 dots if you remember ok. But because of this IQ mismatches what do you think will happen. So, let us say you have this as your vector right for example. like this. So, uh, you will have error around this ok different places ok. 
and then along with each other error what will happen is uh, so let's say you have this and this error component then you will have a delta theta and then you have a different amplitude also so you have amplitude error and then theta error okay so uh, so generally these errors e1 e2 e3 uh, they are happening randomly okay depending upon how the data comes in and so um, you may see in some of the communication papers right you will see the transmitted signal looks like this and after receiving it looks like you have a whole bunch of um, you know spots big spots and you will have a whole bunch of dots that you will see around this and that's pretty much what's going on you know you have a lot of errors um, as a result of which the dot spreads around um, and it looks like a big circle uh, so there are so many points in there uh, it's okay i mean you will have those errors uh, it's just that uh, you have to measure quantitatively um, is this good or bad and these errors will correspond to what bit error rate right because you are transmitting data so so the way uh, the signal constellation in a signal constellation this is what signal constellation is so there is it's called error vector magnitude okay not electronic voting machines evm 1 over v rms that's the maximum amplitude that you're measuring and then 1 over n and n j goes from 1 to e j square kind of you know you measure square error and you take rms of it basically okay and then you uh, you say evm in db is uh, 20 log of em which is right here okay so this is the way you measure how much uh, how much error you have in your um, um, and it's not just uh, uh, the effect of the transmitter you will have also non idealities in the channel and all those things uh, together uh, they will give you overall error vector magnitude okay so one, one thing for sure is that if you have iq mismatches then your EVM will degrade, okay. So uh, if you, uh, if you remember uh, in 0 IF case what we, what whenever we have an issue what do we do, what do we throw at it, CMOS logic right. So if there is a way I could, uh, because CMOS digital is free on chain right, um, uh, you just have to define what you want with it. And in this particular case, what do you do? You do calibrations, okay. So there is, uh, because we know that on between I and Q, there is a mismatch. Uh, there could be amplitude mismatch or phase mismatch. So let's measure both of them and then calibrate it out. And commonly done practice um, uh, in, in CMOS, right. So how do you do that? I'll just give you an example. Um, I mean, I'll go through one example and then maybe from that you can, um, so TX IQ cal, okay. So, uh, what you do is you have your um, this jig, right? So, you make three measurements, and I mean, this is just one example of how to do it. Uh, so, you put in VO cos omega and T, okay, coming in one side, and other side is, of course, uh, cos omega CT, and this side is uh, sin omega CT. Okay, and this is plus minus, and then you measure VO1. Okay, so this is one measurement you do. What does that mean? You only put in V0 uh, known quantities. Okay, before you start your uh, transmitter, um, so you put in V0 uh, cos omega in T, known omega in, and then you let it run through your thing, and then you measure V0. Okay, assume for now that you can measure V0. And what are you measuring? You are not going to look at it on the O scope because the chip cannot do that. So it will just measure average value, okay. And it will measure average value and it will convert to digital and then it will note down what the average value is. So it turns out that if, if there is an error on this side of epsilon and delta uh, theta, okay. I hope you understand what epsilon and uh, delta theta is. Epsilon is the amplitude error which in the previous case I showed you as uh, delta A okay this one and delta theta is the phase error and for the purpose of discussion we will put it only on the cost side it doesn't matter where you put it right finally uh, for the purpose of discussion we will just put it on one side so that it's easy to understand now if 
the error is epsilon and delta theta, epsilon being the amplitude error and uh, delta theta is a phase error. Then um, you can just do the uh, basically trigonometric simplification of this and you can prove it to yourself that the average value, okay, uh, VO1 square of T is equal to VO square divided by 2 plus VO square epsilon, okay. I mean, I will give you a clue about how to solve this, right. So, um, and, and, and then you can kind of do it yourself uh, and maybe that would be your end same question. So, let us say V out 1 is equal to, this is V out 1. So, you have V 0, 1 plus epsilon, okay. And, um, and I, I have cos omega in T and then multiply that by uh, cos omega C T plus delta theta, okay. You got it? I am, I am only looking at the top piece. So, uh, the output V out 1, actually let us call it V O 1, so that you do not get confused, is V O uh, times 1 plus epsilon, that is the error. Uh, epsilon is, uh, you know, ratio error, okay, amplitude ratio error. And then this is our omega in coming in, known omega in, because you can put in anything you want. Uh, you can generate sinusoidal signals on shape and then you can plug them in. And then this is our phase error uh, in the cos side, delta phi, okay. And now if you, you can compute, basically you can split this into two pieces, okay. You know the trigonometric formula for this, right. And then what will happen is that this, this cos phi, um, cos delta phi and sin delta, delta phi will come out. And then you will, you will marry these two guys, omega in and omega c, okay. And then you take average of those. And what will happen is cos square delta phi and sin square delta phi, when you add them together, you will get 1 and I am just giving you the clue about that and eventually what you will end up happening is you will get uh, VO square divided by 2 and you will get 1 plus epsilon square. So, we cheat, we say hey 1 plus epsilon square, I do not care about epsilon square, it is too small. So, then we say it is equal to 1 plus uh, 2 epsilon, you know that right, 2 epsilon and then that is the way you get it, okay. So, that is the clue. Vedant, wake up, okay, good. All right. So, uh, I know uh, math can be boring. Okay. So, you, you saw how to do one piece, right? Or, or one segment of it. Um, and then we do something uh, because, because we have three variables. So, we want to do three types of measurements and then from that we can conclude what is epsilon and what is delta theta. That is all. Okay. So, one measurement gives me uh, this particular value V0 square divided by 2 plus V0 square epsilon. The other method would, uh, other measurement that you do is the following. You, you, you do uh, exactly opposite. Hmm? You ground the top piece and then you, you put your V0 sine omega nt, okay. And this is your sine omega ct and then you sum them together, okay. So, in one case I put in on top, other case I am going to put it on the bottom. And then I would measure v, uh, VO2 and it turns out that if you go through the same, uh, same type of uh, math, VO2 square average value is going to be equal to V0 square by 2, okay. That is what you will get, okay. So, you know now V0 you got and then you got epsilon from the previous equation because you are just making these measurements, you are using an A2D converter and you are trying to solve for all the variables, right. And the last one is, of course, you know, it's simple, right? You did these two, and then you do plus. I'm not going to draw these, but then you combine them together and just feed a common signal, which is V zero cos okay, all right, and then you will measure V O three. And when you measure uh, VO3 average value, okay, then you will get 2 times uh, VO1 square plus sine delta theta. That's what you'll get. VO1 square being uh, the V, V, uh, you know, V, V0 square um, divided by 2 plus V0 uh, square epsilon, okay. So, from these three equations, I can compute all the numbers. I can compute V0, I can compute um, sin theta and I can compute epsilon. 
and then now I have kind of calibrated. Once I know that, right, then I can uh, in digital I can apply proper coefficients in my multiplication factors and kind of compensate for all these errors in transmitter in, uh, in I path and Q path, okay. So, that method is called pre-distortion. So, uh, V0 1 square, uh, you mean the, the trigonometry part? The, I'll, okay, I will go through it one more time. Uh, I will not solve the equation, I can show it to you later on. I mean, I have, I can publish it and give it to all you guys. Uh, but um, and it is not given anywhere. So, I mean you know, so you just have to crunch through the uh, through thing, okay. So, let me explain one more time, okay. Uh, did you understand the block diagram? Okay. So, there is a I path and Q path, okay. And all for purpose of discussion, we are saying that all the errors are in the I path. There is an amplitude error epsilon and there is a phase error delta phi, okay. So, then you understand this equation, right. So, I am just saying this V0 coming in and it has a multiply, I am multiplying by the error 1 plus epsilon in the amplitude, okay. And then cos omega in T which is incoming uh, frequency and then cos omega CT plus delta phi, delta phi being the phase error, okay. You are with me so far everybody, okay. And then we are going to split cos omega CT plus delta phi into two components. What is the equation for that? Cos A plus B is equal to cos A cos B minus sin A sin B, right. So, you will split, basically you, you fragment this piece out and then each one delta phi is going to be constant once it is there, right, okay. So, you will have cos delta phi in one part and sin delta phi in another part, right, no, it is not making sense, okay. Let me just do it then, I think why, uh, yeah, I did not want to spend too much time on it, but let us, if it is not clear then, okay, I will do it. So, um, let us let us assume this is x, so that I can write faster, okay, x and then you have um, cos omega in t, okay. And what is cos omega c t? You will get omega c t and then cos delta theta minus sin omega c t sin delta theta, got it? So far with me? Yes or no? Yes, okay, good. Okay, now we will, what we will do is we will say x and we will combine these two and we will combine these two, okay. So, then you will and then you will have x cos delta theta, delta theta this is constant now, right, delta theta. So, we will leave it outside and then inside you will have cos omega in t and you will have cos omega c t minus uh, cos, oh sorry, uh, is it correct, omega in t and then sin omega c t, okay, got it. Now, we will, uh, this will give you omega in plus omega c t terms and this will also give you omega in um, uh, plus minus omega c t, okay, terms. There will be sin, sin, cos, whatever that is, right. So, once this whole thing is over, right, then uh, you will, um, uh, Okay, I forgot to add the other term. We will also have x sin delta theta and inside that there will be another term, okay, got it. And once this whole thing is over, what you will see is that uh, when you calculate the, you know, average value, what do you do? You take amplitude square divided by 2, right, RMS value. So, when you do that, what will happen is this cos theta square and sin square theta they will go away, okay. And you will end up with uh, an expression that looks like this. Um, uh, you will end up with an expression that will uh, that will look like x um, 1 plus epsilon and then you will have uh, square, okay. So, you will end up with an expression that looks like this v0 square divided by 2 1 plus epsilon square, okay. And cos square, um, uh, if you have a cos omega dash t, you know, that goes away when you take average value, right, correct. 
because we are just trying to figure out what's the average value detected by the A to D converter. The A to D converter is not going to look at the frequency components, it's just going to tell you average value, okay. So, uh, it's going to be V0 square divided by 2, 1 plus epsilon square and then we say that if epsilon is small, then it will be 1 plus 2 epsilon. That's what we will change this to and then uh, that's the value that I gave you which is uh, right here. You know, this is the value that you will get V0 square divided by 2, V0 epsilon. Is it a square epsilon? Okay. Not clear yet? If it is still not clear, I will show you the calculations. Um, I do not want to spend, you know, grunt work, I do not want to spend time on that right now. But conceptually, is it clear to you or? Huh? Hmm. 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 Honey, we already assumed, right? We said one guy is clean and other guy is where the errors are. It is all referred, right? Your path A and path B. Huh? We can assume path B is golden and we say all the errors are on path A, there is nothing wrong with that. Huh. Concept, that is what. Eventually, it will all come out to be um, ratios, that is what it will come out to, okay. Okay, so you get three equations, three unknowns and once I draw the block di diagram, it will be a little bit clearer, okay. But this is the math part, okay. So, um, Basically, uh, there is one more, uh, one more, we, we talked about IQ uh, mismatches and other effect also that can happen is effect of DC offset. So, uh, let us say V out of T is equal to A of T um, and you have uh, cos of phi plus V O S 1. Cos of omega C T minus A of T sin phi plus V O S 2 sin omega C T. Okay. So, all I am saying is that there is an offset in each path, a DC offset in each path, let us say. Okay. Uh, how do you then what do you get? Uh, basically, how, what is the impact of this offset is realistic, right? You are going to see that. Um, and uh, what will happen is um, again, you know, you can saw you can separate these out, and what you will get is you will get a t uh, cos of omega c t plus phi. That is the desired term that you will get out of this, pretty straightforward, right? And then you will get plus v o s 1. Uh, cos omega C T minus V O S 2 sin omega C T. Okay, that is the term we are get. And this, what does this look like? It is a tone at omega C, right? And so, it is called carrier leakage, right? Okay. If you remember something like this, we had seen LO feed through in the receiver case, right? Now, if you if you look at the relative carrier leakage, relative CL is equal to square root of VOS1 square plus VS2 square divided by square root of A of T amplitude. Okay. Now, so what does this do uh, in your uh, in your digital uh, thing, right? You will basically, let us say this was your original uh, uh, QPSK, uh, you will you will see something like this, you will see skewed behavior, okay, depending on the offset on A1 and A2, okay. And because let us say your transmit spectrum was supposed to be this way, okay. And because of carrier leakage, what you will see, you will see something sticking now in the middle at omega c, okay. So, not good, I mean you do not want to send out this carrier leakage, right, in the, right in the middle of the band because it is something that is a uh, function of some random quantities. If VOS1 and VOS2, these are all, uh, you know, path mismatches, okay. So now, um, to make it, make this whole thing work, right, I am going to show you an architecture which will kind of uh, do all the things for us, okay, alright. So this is your Tx, 
I Q Cal. Okay. So you have a baseband processor. And then you have your iPad. This is your cos omega CT, sin omega CT. So, baseband processor is all digital, okay, ones and zeros, right. And then, uh, uh, so then uh, you add these two, correct, plus minus, and this is our transmitted output uh, power, right. So, what you do is you, this is the way you show the power detector just a rectifier okay no it's not a diode it's just a rect rectifier you rectify and then so if you have a sign uh, this thing like this then you after you rectify you do this and you average out you get a power value okay so it's generally shown with a diode uh, but not to be confused that it's not a half wave rectifier okay so this is just a show for power detector so this signal coming out of power detector is just a dc signal Okay, so you can do a crude A to D converter, okay, which gives you digital bits and then you can feed that digital stuff here, okay. And the baseband processor has all the algorithms, it will put the thing in different different modes in the beginning before the uh, your SOC system on a chip powers up, right. So it will do all these measurements and then what it will do is it will say, aha, this is the offset on this side, this is offset on this side and this is the gain error. Um, um, you know, whichever side you want to apply it to and this is a phase error. So, then it will do all the pre-compensations in the signal coming in, but offset it cannot do anything, correct. Um, in the in the signal going in it can do everything, but offset it cannot do that. So, what you simply do is you have a, uh, a D2A converter, D2A converter on both sides, okay. And the D2A converter output you you kind of appropriately cancel out okay so this is your i and q offset control okay and the d2a converter just sets out a dc value up and down till it nulls out okay fairly straightforward hmm? no 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 this is not i channel this is i offset let's call it offset Okay, once you make all the measurements, you have I offset, you have Q offset, you have epsilon, you have delta theta. Okay, so epsilon and delta theta, I am going to mess with my transmit signal, I am going to do pre distortion to take care of that. But the DC offset, I DC and Q DC, I am just going to uh, calculate the, I mean, I have a digital value for both of them, and then I am going to send it to a D2A converter, which will generate analog value because this processor is all digital. Right. So, you have to generate analog values using D2A converter and that DC value you just subtract it out from your path, okay. Huh. No, no, information is not. No, but you, you saw right what happens to your spectrum. When you have offset, you will see a right in the middle of your spectrum you will see this leakage right carrier leakage and that can be anything so we need to take it out we cannot transmit that part so all those uh, uh, basically uh, issues you know because of iq calibrate uh, iq mismatches you take care of them through calibrations okay how about your neighbor cannot listen to you listen to you know other people right you don't want to transmit you want to be only in your band of interest right because it's a very stringent environment you cannot transmit anything outside your band of interest so that is one of the major things see in the receive mode you can do whatever you want right but in the transmit mode you cannot hurt somebody else neighboring so there are very strong restrictions on what you can transmit and if you don't meet that requirement right then you will not be able to uh, get a certification generally okay so that's the main thing main reason we try to do all these things calibrations and the other thing is also your bit error rate will suffer right 
as you saw, if you remember, if you have IQ uh, mismatches, right? If you if you saw the uh, you know those dots, right? They will all get smudged. Now you don't know how much smudge you're going to get because of this IQ calibration. So you did all. बहुत सारे पापड़ बेल के इतना अच्छा receiver बनाया और finally ये पड़ गया. ऐसे हो जाए. So you have to calibrate it out. Otherwise, there is no point in building a very high performance receiver. So uh, it's and digital is free. So you just measure everything, you cancel it out, and then. Uh, and you know all these things are kind of standard practice now. You know, ten years ago it was uh, you have to reinvent the wheel every time. But now, like uh, you know, it's like a flow chart that, that you do IQ calibration, you do it with frequency, you do it with temperature, all those kind of things, so that uh, you know you get per almost perfect result. Uh, the the thing that you are transmitting has to be really good. I mean, it should not uh, it should not. It should not spray outside your band of interest. That's the main thing. Okay. All right. And part of that also we're going to address now. So is this IQ calibration part? You know, you understand now. And uh, how do you do? Um, you know, IQ calibrations plus uh, offset calibration. Okay. This is the way it looks like. Any questions so far? Hmm. Hmm. The power detector, the power detector is just detecting DC, right? What's coming now? DC, right? So uh, I would think. Uh, let me think about this. You are trying to measure. Uh, if I don't transmit anything, I will see some leakage factor, right? Probably. In the in the offset case. You will see a carrier leakage, and uh, I'm pretty sure with carrier leakage we should be able to measure VOS and VOS2 one at a time. Because finally, it's the DC that I'm looking at, correct? Because it's VOS1 cos omega CT, correct? So if it's VOS1 cos omega CT, I can measure VOS1, and that's the way it's done. Okay. So now we'll move on to the linearity. I mean, so far we looked at only uh, mismatches in the path, uh, and things are not perfectly linear either, right? So what happens because of non-linearity? So let's say you're um, and linearity is extremely crucial. So let's say there is a DAC plus mixer non-linearity. Okay, which kind of shown as alpha one x plus alpha three x cube. You're familiar with that, right? The third order nonlinearity. So then, what will our uh, v out one look like, or v out will look like? So v out will look like alpha one a uh, cos of phi uh, plus alpha three a three a cube um, cos cube phi. And this whole thing gets multiplied by cos omega ct, okay, and then minus alpha one a sine phi plus alpha three a cube sine cube phi, and then we have sine of omega ct, okay. So if you readjust everything, uh, what you will see is you will get this term alpha one a plus Again, there is a trigonometry and uh, you know a sine cube relationship that goes to uh, three uh, sine three theta, and then you'll have uh, what else is there? and sine theta, right? It has here. so that will be three by four alpha three a cube, and you'll see I'm I'm kind of telling you the final result omega c t plus five. All right, and that was our desired signal. But along with that, you'll also get this alpha three a cube divided by four uh, cos of omega c t minus three divided by four, not three divided by four, three five. Okay. So this is the undesired term. This is the desired term, which has an amplitude error, which is okay, I guess. Okay. So what happens here in this term 
is you have three times the modulation. Earlier case, this is the desired phi is the desired modulation, here you have three times the modulation. So, of course, when you have three times the modulation, it is going to spread, okay, it is going to spread outside the band of interest. And um, so, this will basically cause spillover uh, out of band, okay, and you will be requiring larger bandwidth. So, there needs to be tight control on linearity. Again, the same as the question that you asked, right? If because of this, what will happen is you will, you can go into the neighboring uh, transmitters, uh, the neighboring receivers uh, uh, spectrum, you know, this, uh, this uh, uh, spillage. So, if you keep, uh, rule of thumb is if you keep uh, your nonlinearity below 1 percent, okay, keep below 1 percent distortion basically, then um, you have negligible impact on, on this. You have three times modulation, right? Earlier we had phi, now I have three times modulation in frequency domain, right? So, you will spread lot more, okay? So, we talked about um, mixer and DAC nonlinearity. The other person that comes into play is our PA nonlinearity, power amplifier. Okay. So, um, there are multiple types of power amplifiers. If you are just doing a phase, uh, um, a, you know, phase modulation, right, then the amplitude does not contain any right. So, for example, if you had a, um, so here the signal is only in the 0 crossings, okay, the phase shifts. Amplitude if I increase it, decrease it does not really matter. So, if I have a non-linear power amplifier, okay, it does not matter, okay. What will happen is that you will, you will amplify, but then you will clip, but the 0 crossing will be okay. Okay. So, what happens at these edges do not matter yeah. and you can you can employ nonlinear uh, power amplifiers. So, uh, you know if you had a, um, um, this is called constant envelope modulation. Then, uh, you know, you will just amplify and you are okay it does not matter if the amplitude gets distorted, okay. You can use nonlinear PA. Um, uh, however, if you if you remember um, there are other modulation schemes, right, where you are, your amplitude is changing like this, let us say, okay, and this is what I am transmitting, let us say. Then uh, anything whenever you reach, a, reach these peaks and if there is a distortion, then we have a problem, right, because what will happen is that if you, if you, you, you want to, um, if the envelope is not constant, then you have to reproduce it faithfully. You have to amplify it and reproduce it faithfully uh, and you have to use linear PAs for that, power amplifiers, okay. So, what will happen is then you will get the same type of signal, this is amplified signal let us say and then at the edges it is getting clipped let us say, okay. Then what happens is let us say your spectrum was looking like this that you are transmitting, let us say this is your band of interest. And then after amplifying what you will see is your spectrum gets amplified, but then you will also have some um, spillage out of band as I like to call it, you know. So, you will enter into, uh, it will spread outside band because of the distortion, okay. Anytime you have distortion, you spread. Um, so, this is a problem, this spillage is a problem, okay. It is called spectral regrowth. When your PA is, sub, we need a P, linear PA, but it has certain distortion, yeah. So, in this case, uh, because it is not a constant envelope modulation, you have to have linear PAs. Uh, however, linear PA, no matter what you say, it will start getting distorted, okay, and you will have this spillage. So, uh, coming back to uh, answer your question, right, 
when you transmit the signal, let us say this is a GSM, okay, then you have certain masks which looks like this. Uh, So, it, this is all specified in the uh, in the book uh, specification of GSM, right. So, they will say oh this is 0.5 and here you should have minus 30 dB attenuation, here I want minus 33 dB attenuation, here I want minus 60 dB attenuation like that and then they specify the frequencies also, okay. So, this is your desired signal uh, you know 200 kilohertz and then as you go outside the band how much can you spray outside the band is strictly defined, okay. So, what you are ideally supposed to do is this, this is what your signal should look like. You should have everything within this, okay. Let us say you had to, this is the way it should look like. However, because of all the non-linearities and other business, what you will end up seeing is something like this, okay. So, under all conditions in the spectrum domain, none of this should go you know over the mask. It is a very stringent requirement under all conditions, processing, temperature, part to part variation, everything for the whole radio, you cannot transmit outside the band, okay. And they, they have a strict outlines about that. Let us say you have one spur coming out, you are dead, okay, because that means that you know three channels away. Uh, you are going to interfere with that, okay. So, uh, so these things are taken very seriously uh, in terms of measurement. So, um, it is really important by design um, you take care of this, okay. So, you have to pay a lot of attention and that is where all these, I am kind of picking out a few points where all these things kind of connect the dots, yeah, okay. So, for example, um, also in the GSM case, right, um, yeah, maybe we should skip that, that is a can treat that information. Together meaning? Huh. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it is all taken into account. Yeah, yeah, no, when the specifications are given, the specifications are designed such that all these combinations effect is included in the in the specification. So, as long as you follow your specification and then uh, according to the GSM spec, if there are so many transmitters within a room or something like that, then their combined effect is already considered. Yeah, yeah, all that stuff is already taken into account. Yeah, yeah. So, these are very worst case type of scenarios that they, they, they want you to work with, okay. So, the specification is designing. Uh, or defining a specification by itself for anything is quite an art and so many people work together. So, uh, I will tell you the inside story how this thing works, right, uh, because I was part of uh, one process, uh, unfortunately we failed, uh, we were designing ultra wideband, uh, you know, uh, transceivers and uh, we were one of the pioneers in that area in our startup company uh, where you would uh, uh, basically, uh, you know, Every device will have this ultra wideband transmitter inside your device so that let us say you took a picture, it automatically shows up. Uh, it is like wireless USB pretty much at that high data rate. So, you do not have to connect anything, you will always be connected. Uh, 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 like, for example, connect to the monitor, you do not need this cable, it will automatically connect through wireless USB. So, that kind of product we had. But in that case, what happened was um, everybody, every company wants to push their agenda, right. So, they have certain uh, certain capital in terms of okay, I know how to do this, right. So, then they will twist arms of the uh, uh, organizing agencies uh, to, to say that oh, it has to work under this condition. So, they will make sure that nobody else's device will work, only their device will work and all these games are played and eventually then there is a divorce saying that okay, you go your way, I will go your way and the, the spec fails. So, it is really uh, you know how do you get a spec? Um, ratified uh, so that everybody agrees to the same spec is uh, is quite difficult. So, in these case like GSM, Bluetooth, um, they go through a lot of uh, pain and suffering in the beginning, but finally they come to an agreement there because finally everyone's device has to work with every other person's device as a user, right. Otherwise, uh, that spec has failed. 
So, it is really important um, that final goal is achieved uh, so that the specs are defined in such a way that you know there is some margin, some negotiation that happens behind the scenes so that everyone's device gets approval and everyone's device kind of works uh, under under certain kind, I mean all conditions as far as possible. But that is the behind the scene uh, specmanship that happens. So, if you are doing a startup company and you are coming up with something new right, you need to have somebody uh, who is defining specs for you. Otherwise, you are doomed. I mean you are doomed for failure. I will tell you right away. Uh, because unless you have somebody in uh, who is kind of attending all these meetings for specs, defining specs. For example, 5G specs right. Let us say you want to develop a chipset for 5G and you do not have a person representing your company in the 5G uh, you know international uh, spec uh, meetings. Uh, you will never succeed. I will give it to you in writing because what goes on over there right in terms of specs you will never get to even know uh, 2 years later uh, by the time the spec is ratified and then you are kind of at a disadvantage because now you cannot design the, the first chip in the market because you just do not know what to design period. Uh, so, specmanship is really important and you have to pay as a startup company or any company you have to pay a lot of attention to specs. So, whenever a spec comes out they will always have oh, Intel is part of it, Samsung is part of it, Apple is part of it because all these people you know big gorillas I like to call them they are there to kind of mark their territory and they will make sure that nobody else um, you know they want to be a monopoly in that market right. So, they will try to make sure that um, only their device works um, and then they will want other people to patent their stuff. And one of the reasons Qualcomm succeeded as a company was specs you know they came up with the CDMA and they had all the patents related to that and then they said yeah, yeah you can use our CDMA but just pay us the money and their early revenues are all because of royalties. Uh, so and that is the reason people said no, no, no we do not want to do CDMA even though TDMA has problem we will do it because I do not want to pay Qualcomm ok. So, other um, distortion component that you have to worry about is uh, you know your PA. Okay. So, um, what happens is that you have this transfer function and finally, you will have 1 dB compression point right. Okay, I am running, you forgot. So, um, in uh, if you remember um, you know we are feeding the signal. some signal uh, at the input let us say uh, V in and then this is what is going uh, at the output you know how to do that right output. And then as you start going close to this uh, compression point right you will start getting distorted the peaks will start getting distorted and as I told you again as they get distorted you start spreading outside the band and that is a problem. So, then this P 1 dB is the way you are characterizing linearity of the system ok. And the reason uh, for that is uh, basically any um, you know let us say you are transmitting this signal let us say at minus 33 dB ok. This is your transmitted signal, but then you will have to be below certain level ok in the neighboring receive band this is R x band for the next guy ok. And you want to be below uh, minus 162 dBc per hertz ok. So, that the receiver does not see neighbors transmitted signal ok. So, that is a very stringent spec um, and you should be able to uh, receive sensitive signal uh, while this strong transmitter is there in the neighboring uh, neighboring place right. So, um, this is one of the most stringent specs basically the transmit uh, mo mobile transmitter should not affect the receiver mobile receiver neighboring mobile receiver. Okay. I will um, talk about one last thing and then um, then we will move on to our uh, other topics that we wanted to talk about and uh, rest of the stuff you can kind of look through the notes it is not that hard. Um, the, the topic I wanted to talk about was uh, called oscillator pulling.
ok. So, here we have this um, uh, I and uh, this is our LO, LO has the VCO and then we have the Q coming in and then we add them together here correct plus minus and then this is our PA. I am just showing one, uh, one signal. Now, this signal coming out of the PA is very, very large signal. I mean, you know, we are talking about 10s and 20s volt, 20 volts, ok. So, uh, uh, it can be uh, 20 volts peak to peak, uh, which corresponds to 1 watt in 50 ohm, ok. So, what happens then? So, this strong signal, uh, multiple mechanisms it will couple back into the chip, even though if the PA is outside, right. It will go through your, um, uh, you know, package parasitics, it will go through the PCB traces, the ground planes, uh, bond wires, radiation, everything you can think of because it is such a large signal. Uh, even if it is 100 dB down on chip, it becomes a small, uh, a large signal. And what it, it will, where it will go is it will eventually get into your VCO, ok. So, what happens is that you are already, the VCO let us say is running at omega C and you are transmitting omega C ok. Then um, this large signal can disturb the tank, uh, the LC tank of your VCO and VCO can go off tune ok and that is what is called uh, oscillator pulling. So, there are many methods um, I will, I will just uh, kind of talk about them, but the pictures you can look at it from the notes. One of the things you do is um, you can, you can run this VCO as I told you at twice the frequency ok. And then you use a dividers, if you remember, to generate I and Q signals. So now uh, this signal, the transmitted signal is at omega C, but my VCO is running at 2 omega C. So I am okay. That is a common technique that is used. The other technique people also use is they run the VCO because you are running the VCO at twice the frequency, that is kind of hard. Because it is so far away in frequency domain, right? Yeah, frequency domain is so far away that it does not, but if it is right next, it is like you know, uh, you are singing a certain note and Vedant suddenly starts singing around that note, right? you will waffle because you are, you will lose unless you are a classical singer, you can hold your note, right. Uh, but the feedback coming into you through your ears will modify your vocal cords, it is exactly what happens here. Um, the, the LC VCO starts getting slightly off tune and it will lock on to different signals different things. And so, to take care of that effect, what you do is you just run, you know, if you are running at 2, 2x the pitch, then you are ok, uh, then it does not disturb you. Only when the difference is extremely small, uh, that is when the problem comes, ok. So, one solution is you run at twice the VCO frequency. Uh, of course, you have to spend power because you are running at twice the frequency. So, what is obvious other solution? You run at half the frequency and when you run at half the frequency, you double, you use a doubler frequency doubler, no frequency doubler, you can just do a frequency doubler, omega c you double to 2 omega c. So, PLL comes in to generate omega c. So, instead of running at omega c, you generate omega c divided by 2 and you do the doubling part, ok. Um, and so, then, uh, huh? no, no, this is just a doubler, all it does is takes one frequency and it doubles it just using a circuit, analog circuit. So, there is no PLL involved in this case. Hmm? Uh, Let us not do that right now because I will lose out couple of things, uh, but I can uh, I can show you offline maybe later on, ok. No, no, PLL you can double, but like uh, it is like uh, solving uh, or killing an ant with a cannonball, you know that is the analogy I can give you. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean PLL is a lot more accurate and you know you are you are trying to step it in really small things, right, those kind of things. But frequency doublers are very simple. However, frequency doublers, you know, um, uh, you have to use polyphase filters. So, then the power consumption goes up on those things uh, to create I and Q signals. Uh, the other method is just use mixers. You know, you take, uh, you take uh, omega divided by 2 and you mix it with itself and, uh, and you can, uh, you can generate uh, the tones that you desire. Uh, something like that. So, those are the variety of methods by which you can get rid of this oscillator pulling problem. So, I will stop at that note. Uh, the details of whatever I talked about are the pictures are I will sh share with you on the notes, uh, but the thing I wanted to talk about is next week, ok. Uh, that is important. Uh, one of them is uh, maybe you can bring your stuff here. 
um, uh, next week we have the uh, the closure of our project there is no extension on project uh, so you have to finish your project by tuesday next week okay and i wanted to show you how i expect your project to look like okay because uh, it's not just going to be me and other professors going to look at we have some visitors coming in uh, who are uh, uh, you know um, who are giving, going to give you awards right they have sponsored the the awards for the competitions so just like last year uh, so last time i think it was done a uh, little bit at the last minute but this time i had enough time uh, so they will uh, they, the other the companies are going to come and they're going to look at your stuff so i would like you to do really well in that right because uh, you represent what i have taught you so far um, so few things i wanted to show you is uh, kind of what um, what am i expecting you know after um, so first of all you know how should your schematics look like okay this is not the VCO schematic, but I'm just telling you how the uh, how the VCO your schematic should look like. You know, very clearly uh, displayed because person who's going to be there to review your stuff, and uh, you know uh, they're going to make a decision so quickly, right? With limited amount of information, they are not going to look at your simulation results and things like that. So you should kind of uh, make them interested in what you're doing, right? So you have to if you draw your schematics in a clumsy way. Uh, they are going to just eh, and they will move on to the next person right and you are going to not so benefit from that. So uh, and and these are the techniques that I would like you to carry forward in everything else that you do also. So draw your schematics very cleanly that is my first uh, as if they are written in a textbook right. Uh, so remove the clutter and make sure you annotate all the information like what is the size of this device that device so that people will ask you hey, why did you choose this in this way that way. And you should be able to answer fairly quickly those questions. Okay. Um, now let's talk about uh, what was the other thing you had. Uh, okay. So you, your results, I think they they have certain uh, way the results look uh, should look like. So we don't want to overburden people with too much information, right? So let's keep it really simple. Show some of, some key plots. Uh, for example, the tuning plot or a phase noise plot or you can show that the VCO is really oscillating, the transmit waveform, okay. And then on the bottom, whenever you, uh, you are doing your design reviews, wherever you work generally. So what you start off with is, okay, here you forgot the specification, okay. First you write specification in one column. Next column, what are my schematic results and what are my after layout results, okay. And you should be able to explain everything why it happened in the layout this way, okay. Um, and as long as you can do that, you are in good shape, okay. So uh, the most important part of course, I haven't shown you uh, is uh, yet is how your layout should look like, okay. So this is looks nice, right, but I will start criticizing and you will hate it, okay. So um, I gave him a lot of hard time by the way already. Okay, so this is the way people evaluate. It's like you know uh, these beauty contests, right? Uh, how do you? How, what is the beauty of your layout, right? First hard time I gave him was, hey, look at this, right? Okay, so if you if you look at this, and if you look at this, they're different. The length. Okay, so this is. You know what this is, right? The Jalebi structure, that is inductor, okay. And then these are the two lines which are going down, okay. And then this goes down like this and this goes down like this, okay. And then everything is kind of hanging off those two lines, if you will, okay. And now once you see it, you can see that, oh, it does not look all that symmetric, right. So remember the trick, you have to be lazy when you do work, right. And how do you be lazy? You do minimum amount of work, you do half the circuit and then you flip it around so that everything looks perfect, okay. So um, yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, I mean, you know, then it, these things will not happen that uh, one of the lines is slightly off and it is, even if it is off by half a micron, I will point it out. I can, I can see because once you have seen the layout so many times, you can immediately tell and suddenly then you say, what is this stuff here, right? It's, uh, this stuff does not look symmetric, why is it here? Right. So all the stuff that should be inside 
uh, close to each other needs to be matching, matching related, right? So if if any of you who have not done layout before, like a quality layout, you can refer to the last uh, semester's layout lecture number 23, is it? I think it's 23. Lecture number 23 where I went through how do you, uh, you know, go through all the layout basics, how do you make symmetric layouts and all those things. So uh, this is what I'm expecting out of you uh, is, is, you know, really good quality layout where it looks beautiful. I mean, uh, visually you can tell if you have done a good job, uh, you know, within 30 seconds you can tell this layout is good or bad. And if you fill up something to make it look good, I can make out that pretty quickly. So, uh, uh, you know what I am saying? Uh, so, make sure that it looks nice and uh, uh, symmetric. Symmetry is, uh, and of course, functionality you have to, you have to look at it properly, uh, everything that you do. And you know, uh, what I see in the previous layouts, the, the previous project layout, everybody is using tiny lines, like uh, they are drawing uh, layout as if it is a digital connection, right? Uh, they are using like 0.2 micron lines and things like that. You do not do that in analog circuits especially for signal lines, right, they are really fat and uh, like for example, I would not draw it this way right now. What I would do is, okay, okay, I can draw it only, only here or what, okay, you, you have this circuit, right, then you have this and then you can do this, you see what I am saying, you kind of funnel it out uh, so that uh, you, you can connected that way and then the, where you place your grounds and supply, the grounds, ground and supply has to be fat runners. Uh, if you are using a center tapped inductor, make sure your VDD is, huh? VDD is coming in nice and big on one side and ground comes in on the bottom, nice and clean, okay. Digital signals which are coming in, you just show the ports wherever they are, okay, you put ports and mark it nicely. Uh, this is my VDD port, this is my ground port, this is where my VTune is coming in and I am isolating it nicely so that there is no noise couples through. So the more the thinking that you put into your layout, right, you will benefit is what my point is, okay. And um, these details will take you a long way um, in, I mean, you may not do, uh, do layout for rest of your life, but if you know these subtleties, right, then you can question everybody who is working with you and keep them on your toes, uh, on their toes, so that they, they do a good job for you, okay. So um, kind of think through all those things, you know, do not just slap it together and DRCL, we just, eh, it works, okay, all right, I will move on to the next project, that kind of thing. You know, do a good job and, you know, make sure your layouts, if you have multiple inductors is fine, um, you know, I would really like to see variety of architectures from all of you. So do not try to fit to, uh, oh, if I use two inductors, I am going to be big. We did not give you, did we give them a requirement in terms of size? Size is not the only criteria. If stuff is big, it is okay because you are trying something new, right? So you have to spend and you have to spend some real estate. So the that is okay. So uh, I am perfectly fine with you trying out something new, but just be able to explain it, why I did it this way. Why did I choose PMOS? Uh, Pair. Why did I choose NMOS pair? Why did I choose complementary pair? Why did I choose two inductors? You know, whatever you are doing, uh, pick a theme and kind of try to explain all those things. Let us say you optimize only phase noise, that is fine, that is great because then you beat that phase noise really, really down compared to everybody else, right? So uh, it is going to take some work, but I hope you enjoy the process uh, in, in presence of all other assignments which are going on, right? Okay. Because there is uh, kind of nice good reward in front of you and you can claim that you can when you go out in your resume you can say that hey you know you took my class and you won this award and that will take you oh really okay good you know because these are kind of important projects in that sense um, and I am telling you nobody I have not seen a single class right now where people go through schematic design layout design, parasitic extraction, all the elements. So, and you have done it twice already. So, you guys are way ahead of everybody else, okay. Uh, yes, in the MTech projects and things like that, people do it, but as a part of the class, uh, nobody does it, okay. But do not miss the, the show because it is kind of fun part of the course because you get to interact with a lot of other faculty and uh, other people and they will give you critical feedback like, ye hai, wo hai, all those kind of things. 
and I'm trying to showcase what you guys have done to everybody else in the department. So our head of the department will show up. It's kind of nice, you know, to show off whatever work you have done. So do a good job and good luck for your uh, layout and presentation. Thank you.